thank you for coming today. This is a part of the Chibakogyo Daigaku Henkak Center uh, speaker series. And we'll start first, I guess, by introductions. I'm the director of the Henkaku Center here. Uh, it's uh, the Center for Radical Transformation. And uh, actually, Eric and Tenzin are both uh, researchers here as well. And then Sputniko, or Hiro, is a uh, guest mm. from uh, Gedai. Yes. But should we maybe go in this order and do a quick self-introduction? Uh, OK. So uh, I'm Eric Salovir. So I'm French. Uh, uh, I'm a consultant, so an advisor at the Holy See, the Vatican, for uh, all the tech and digital topics. Uh, the same for the French government. And I, I lead a foundation called Human Technology Foundation, trying to put the human being at the center of uh, development of technology. So try to have a technologies for the common good. And uh, yeah, more or less, that's what we do. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, my artist name is Sputniko. My real Japanese name is Hiro Ozaki, so you can call me Hiro today. I think a lot of Japanese people don't know my real name. <laughs> they, they know me as Sputniko. But. And uh, I, I'm an artist, and uh, I specialize in speculative design. So that's um, sort of using design to tell um, stories about different, um, different scenarios of future to allow people to imagine the implications of technologies like AI, bio, or blockchain. And then by imagining the futures, then people could have very meaningful, meaningful discussions and conversations about them so that we could better understand what's the better future that we want for ourselves. And also being growing up in Japan as a woman interested in technology, and Japan's not that great for gender equality for some time. I have strong interest in technology and um, gender equality and diversity. So um, I'm very, uh, I'm thankful for being invited to such a wonderful um, panel. <laughs> like, I'm very honored and I, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tenzin Priyadarshi. I run the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT and also a researcher here at Tenkaku. Um, uh, the center was founded by six Nobel Peace laureates uh, who were concerned about uh, the deficit of ethics, uh, so to speak, in ethics, uh, in education and leadership. And a part of our work, not all of our work, but a part of our work um, uh, deals with uh, the, uh, the notion of ethically aligned design or what it is that uh, prompts uh, both individual designers and, and companies, design companies, to deeply reflect on the short and long-term implications of whatever it is that they're designing. And in the spirit of that, I, uh, we are convening today as well uh, to continue that conversation. So uh, shall we begin? Yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think we'll uh, um, keep the conversation pretty exploratory. And, and again, it's a delight and a joy to uh, have all of you here. Uh, uh, to commence um, uh, this sort of series of conversation, which we hope will be one of many. Um, and we chose the topic of transhumanism with its broadest sort of implication um, uh, in terms of both exploring the relationship between human, humanity, the broader world, and how technology is evolving. And I thought what I would do is begin with just a simple sort of um, uh, uh, definition of transhumanism uh, that was popularized by Julian Huxley in the 1950s and 60s. And Julian is brother of perennial philosopher Aldous Huxley. Um, and, um, and he said that, and, and not to sort of start off at a downer, uh, you know, it's not a doomsday scenario that most ethics and technology conversations happen, but it's, it was a pretty sort of um, a realistic description of what was happening in the world. So he starts with something like this. Up till now, human life has generally been, as Hobbes described it, nasty, brutish, and short. The great majority of human beings, if they have not already died young, have been afflicted with misery. We can justifiably hold the belief that these lands of possibility exist, and that the present limitations and miserable frustrations of our existence could be in large measure surmounted. 
the human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself. Not just sporadically, an individual here in one way, an individual there in another way, but it's in its entirety as humanity. So it's not, I don't, I don't want to juxtapose the conversation as human versus machine. Mm -hmm. But looking at as we are sort of evolving um, and dealing with some of the large scale technologies now constituting AI, machine learning and so on, uh, looking at what the relationship ought to be between the humans and the machines. So let me start with just a, a simple framing because uh, uh, Hero, I consider uh, artists and science fiction people as futurists in certain <laughs> ways. You, you have this incredible gift to, to imagine what the, what the future might look like. Yeah. And as we're experiencing a lot of science fiction writers of the past, predicted to, to some closer degree of the, 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 the present that we are living in, in, in some ways. What do you think should be, as an artist, um, as a technologist, some of the things that designers or tech designers should reflect on vis-a-vis -vis humanity, vis-a-vis -vis humans, as we move forward in, in our design process? Mm. It's a very complicated, difficult question, but um, I think one aspect I like to touch about transhumanism is that I think for so many years when people discuss transhumanism, we kind of have an idea that you know, if human is at this stage, then technology progresses human. Like, it's like a plus effect. Mm -hmm. Like this civilization, humanity is always progressing in one way and technology is the, um, the pushing. But I think in the recent five or 10 years, I think we're starting to realize that a lot of the technologies and especially the internet we thought would uh, progress civilization forward or humanity forward, but it seems to be putting civilization in some kind of chaos, especially democracy or election systems or, or trying to create harmony in um, civilization. So I think that, that's, so that's one thing about transhuman, the word transhumanism, which I like to question is, what what's, is better? Is technology making humanity better or trans, transcend mm -hmm. hu, uh, humanity? And then, so I think as, I guess going back to your question, what shall we reflect on? Is maybe the idea, maybe we need to reflect more like, of have technology, <laughs> has really technology made civilization better? And what is the idea of better? And I think there are things we might, rather than being stronger, faster, more efficient, maybe there are problems that need to be solved in society, like poverty or miscommunication, and that's more transhuman than human living life forever or running super fast. Or, yeah, that's, that's what I feel about okay. the word, yeah. Very good. I'll, I'll go to Joey and then I'll come to you, Eric, mm -hmm. one second. Joey, you ran for the longest time uh, or uh, been with people who actually had a vision of techno-utopia mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that sometimes seems crashing, sometimes seems promising. Uh, where are you on, on this yeah. today? And, and so kind of riffing a little bit on what um, Sputjan Hero just said mm -hmm. is, um, I think the word solve um, is, let, let's, I'll use the word problematic. And even at MIT, <clears throat> the big conference was called Solve for X, as if there's a solution. Mm -hmm. And the MIT, campaign was for a better world. And I always ask for who at what time scale? Because I think one mm -hmm. of the points that Sputniko is making is that progress is actually kind of a weird idea, right? Because evolution is actually a, a search. And what you're doing in any kind of evolutionary system is you're trying to find a state that's slightly more comfortable for you than the one that you're in. And depending on the environment, the direction is different, right? And, and I think becoming more powerful isn't necessarily better. And I think that a lot of the techno-utopians believe that becoming more powerful makes you smarter, but it, it doesn't actually make you, it, it, it smarts kind of a weird thing. It does, because I think the po 
point is that the world isn't a game you're trying to win, mm -hmm. and the world isn't a problem you're trying to solve. You're just trying to evolve into a system that's more appropriate for the environment that you're in. And, and that appropriateness could be up in some moments, it could be down in others, right? And I think that that's, there's no direction up, really, I think is, is I think, a thing. I mean, things do move forward, like entropy, and you know, things get become more complex. But in, in overall, I think the, the misguided idea, I think, in, is that there is a function that we're trying to solve, mm -hmm. and with smarter machines, we can solve it. As Sputnik was saying, is it, becoming more powerful actually becomes, if we're, if we're wrong, we just become more powerfully wrong. And if we're confused and complicated, it just becomes even faster and more confused. And I think one of the problems that we are facing is we're like putting jetpacks on everything, but we're all pointed in uncontrollable ways. So I, and I think that the singularity people though, which are a new, kind of the newer version after Huxley, is I think the key thing is that they believe that given enough compute power, it will eventually become wise or smart. You know? And I think that the academic computer scientists these days, I think that we've been, and there's a paper that I'll, we'll link in the video, believe that you can't really solve for ethics. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the singularity people believe that with given enough technology, we'll eventually transcend our problems okay. and that we'll become so smart that it will become wise. And it's kind of a, not to use a Catholic term, it's like a Hail Mary. It's kind of like, <laughs> we don't really know how we get there, but we see all of these graphs just right. going up to infinity, life expectancy, computer power, that something must happen here mm -hmm. when it becomes infinite. And maybe that's God, you know, a, a, a singularity God, right? But I think another thing is just the singularity curve, which is showing that all technology seems to asymptote at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people say that th uh, the beginning of an S-curve, which is what most mm -hmm. things do, looks like <laughs> an asymptote, yeah. uh, asymptote right? That's but once true. you get here, it slows down. And so I think that that theory that just follow the curve also is kind of has some right. issues. But to, but to answer the question, yeah, I'm very much with Sputnik and I don't think that more power makes us better. And I think the biggest question is how do we become better, mm -hmm. not how do we become more powerful, which is, I think, part of the problem with the current um, transhumanist discussion. Part of the problem with the current current framing, certain framing. Of yeah, and that, that that AI will solve our problems. Right. That, that's yeah. a we our problems actually aren't solvable. I right. think. Right. Yeah, Eric. Yeah, and actually, I think I, I'm clear on the same page. And I, I think that yeah, having uh, more uh, power doesn't give us more wisdom. That's for sure, and not not more moral ability. And for for me, the real increase would be the increase in this kind of moral ability to have a, like a better judgment or kind of discernment. And this is probably what is currently missing. And perhaps, uh, uh, yeah, I think during those uh, five to 10 past years, what we had is we, we again made a difference between um, uh, innovation and progress. Yeah, and what's new is not always better, unfortunately. And, and, and we see that uh, we will have to, yeah, to go for something better, as you said. But j just I wanted to, uh, I would say, challenge a little bit this uh, uh, definition from Exley about uh, 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 transhumanism, because I say he, uh, at some point it speaks about transcend ourselves. So what yeah. does it mean? Does it mean that we have to become something else, or do do we? Ha does it mean that we have to become better? what we're supposed to be, what we're meant to be. And to my mind, that's, I mean, a transhumanism... I think, I think he's referring to self-transcendence and as yeah, in becoming I, better. No, I understand. But the, the point is just that the way it's interpreted very often is that like uh, leading us to something like a new species or something new mm -hmm. or like uh, creating a computer that could solve our problem. But for me, this is like... Um, the, the, we abandon our responsibility to a computer that would be the worst uh, possible uh, situation. And I think that really we, we need to see that as a way to be better human. For me, if you, uh, transhumanism means something like humans in transition, but in transition to where? Mm -hmm. And we consider that now we can take over about the, the direction. Previously, nature was guiding us or God, depending on your belief. But I would say either God or nature did a pretty good job up to now. Yes, our life was short. Our life was uh, full of uh, suffering or whatever. But actually, when you see the way species evolve, I would say it's not that bad. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure we could do better, personally. No, I mean, we had several mass extinctions in, in the history of Earth, and each time 
life recovered in a fantastic way, new ways of new species were created uh, and involved and they were perfectly in adequation with uh, their ecosystem and so on. All that we're absolutely unable to do. And so uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, we need to yeah, take care on the way we pretend to take over and the point is more to work on ourselves to be better versions of ourselves instead of trying to be like gods. Yeah. So, so let's, you know, so it's easy to, I mean, one thing is, uh, in some ways, the panel is interesting or lack of interest because everybody's on the same page, yeah, then it doesn't help. <laughs> so, so I have to take a, a <laughs> contrarian view uh, in some ways. But also, you know, it's, it's easy to arg argue about the end of the spectrum mm -hmm. of things. You know? But let's say we are transhuman already, even in, um, in the most conservative terms. We use artificial hearts, mm -hmm. right? We use artificial limbs. Should we get rid of those technologies because we want to be fully human or experience being fully human? Like, you have, uh, I don't know if you remember, Joy, uh, Hugh Herr had this interesting thing uh, where he was uh, giving a demo of one of these artificial limbs. Uh, but prior to that, he asked all the doctors and everybody was talking about repairing mm -hmm. the, the, the limb rather than replacing yep. the thing. And, and Hugh's thing was basically, but replacing would make it so much better. Yep. Yeah. And, and he, and he has a, actually a wonderful or very interesting story of a little girl who yeah. has terrible ankles right. and had so many operations, but the doctors kept trying to fix them. And she eventually amputated and got robotic limbs and was running around. And I think that's the point is that, that do, you, do you have to struggle to always be as human as possible? You know, and, and, and with, yeah. But for, for me, being more human doesn't mean to reject technology. It's more, I mean, it, it's on, on like two different ways. I mean, y you can have like an artificial arm and so on. You will not be less human because you have more technology in you. And, and keep it, replacing until, <laughs> until you get artificial no, <laughs> the, 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 po the point for me is, is more, I mean, what makes us human or unhuman, inhuman? I mean, and very often this is just like the moral choices and the way you interact with the others and so on. Mm -hmm. That's the point. And that's, and, and how do you contribute to the common good and how do you contribute to the society? So for me, the human being is like, like it's not like an entity. It's yeah. not a, it's a person. It's a person when it's collected, connected so, to the but others. We've, we've been pretty bad as hum humans in judging who should be human because until recently, women couldn't vote. Right. Until recently, black people in America couldn't vote. Even today, if you have a mental disability, you're not allowed to have control of your own life. Uh, autistic people are often treated inhumanely. And I think that, you know, at, at some point we get into the realm of animals, right? And I know with, in religions you have s certain lines, but I, I sometimes feel that my dog is smarter than some humans, you know? And, and so, so it's kind of like at what point is, so, so moving away from machines for a second, you know, like what, what do you have to have to be permitted to be called human? And it, what if it's a, you know, it, but yeah, if it's a clone, what if there are lots of different types of humans that would be created given the technology that we have now, right? right? Uh, and and, and yeah. th th that's, that's a great direction and, and I would like you to respond, but don't make it about bioethics. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. boring. Yeah. Let's talk about the future in that way. So. Yeah, I would say perhaps it, it doesn't answer directly to your uh, question, but I would say at some point we have to see humanity as a community So and consider that each member of uh, this community from the most disabled people to uh, the elder and really uh, or underprivileged people, all of that, they have this kind of same dignity. And this mm -hmm. is something that, I mean, uh, as the Catholic Church is fighting for, uh, that we don't remove the dignity of someone because he or she is disabled or as you said we struggled but we also evolved in terms of gender balance in terms of uh, uh, taking all the ethnicity in in uh, in consideration and so on uh, but at the same time i would say that uh, humanity is a kind of continuum so i, I remember always this uh, poem from Rudyard kipling if and it finishes by you will be a man my son 
And so it may, if you are able to do that and do that, so it means that also humanity is something that you get from the very beginning and the dignity is what yours and cannot be removed. But at the same time, you also become a human with your experience and you have to become a human and you have to receive this humanity. And frankly, during the 19th century, there were those awful, awful uh, uh, um, experiences by, like uh, raising a kid without saying a single uh, word to him. And uh, for sure, uh, the, 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 yeah, the kid could not flourish and could not even be fully human because he did not have the language uh, function and so on. And so we see that part of this humanity we receive from the community. And so the question is, how do we help the community to make, to make better humans by uh, uh, increasing this kind of interactions? Let, let, let's, let's, let's go back to the framing of dignity. So uh, here I'm going to... Uh, frame this issue for you because we are in Japan. Uh, uh, historically, the way we would treat elderly and care for them in a dignified manner was through human interactions, meaning historically we have evolved where we took care of our elders, right? Increasingly we see that is not feasible and, and Japan is one of the countries where we see increasingly design of, of uh, robots, design of certain kinds of technologies that play intermediary to that, meaning how do you treat elderly with dignity and care? Because humans are not there. They don't have time, apparently, or they don't think that they're responsible for it. And chances are, the way we are progressing, that most affluent societies would opt for that model, that they would tell their elderly, here is a robot, and, and, and that should take care of, uh, of the thing. How do you sort of uh, reconcile this idea of dignity as human interaction versus putting the machine in the middle? Mm. Well, th th it's an interesting question because, yeah, Japan's an aging country, so there's been a lot of... Uh, by the way, this week, I think 65% of the population is aging population, apparently. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we have officially reached the threshold where there's more aging possible population Japan than... Japan or than globally? Than yeah. Globally. Yeah. Globally. globally. Yeah. I think um, it, it's difficult sometimes because um, I, I f so I, my mum, my mother, she's in her 70s, and I try to telephone her every day, have a conversation because she's living in Japan, and there aren't that many English-speaking friends in Japan, so I'm one of her few friends that she can speak English with, and. Okay, my mom's going to be watching this, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're not, like, it's, our conversations we, we, are quite we, simple. We all love you, mom. <laughs> hey, I love you. I'm not going to say anything bad about our conversation, <laughs> but our conversation's pretty simple. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, hey, how are you doing? What's up? You know, are you doing fine? What, what did you do today? Mm -hmm. And, uh, at which I, I enjoy the conversation. But uh, sometimes, you know, I think about, all these other people who can't be calling their mother every mm -hmm. single day. And not that I'm going to do this, mom, but what if I create an AI that can copy my voice mm -hmm. and call my mother and have a similar conversation? Mm -hmm. But our conversation is not that complicated, so I think an AI could recreate my conversation quite easily. W would that be a great thing for my mother if I can't call her every single day if I'm busy. Right. So that, that was the thought experiment. And I thought maybe it might benefit a lot of people in my generation in Japan mm -hmm. with aging parents. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I, I think it could benefit them because uh, conversation is very important for mm -hmm. them. But if you replace all like 100% to that AI, I don't think that's a good idea, but maybe 15%, 20%. So, so uh, adding a limit to that thing. Yeah, but uh, it's, this is a difficult thing. I don't Which, think yeah, there's a... Would be the recipient that decides that? Yeah. Uh, my mom, but yeah. I bet she's going to be like, I want to talk to my daughter 100%. But, 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 that, but, but that is one of the challenges, right? Like yeah. one of the things that, uh, you know, people in the AI group are talking about just passing the Turing test to, to, to be close to him. And, yeah. and one of the petitions going around um, uh, uh, is that uh, a user right to know whether they're talking to an AI, AI versus or not, you know, or, or, or real human. But, but that's the whole thing, that we are, when we're introducing terms like dignity and care, mm -hmm. right? 
are we lessening dignity or are we lessening our sense of care by designing something of this nature which is but already in process? Yeah, j j just a suggestion, instead of designing an AI uh, able to talk to your mother, if you design an AI that automates part of your work and spares you time so you can call your mother, is it not better? I, I guess, I, I guess mean, that's, that could be another way of taking yeah, it. Yeah, because I mean, <laughs> perhaps we don't focus on the right thing and right. I, I admire that you're able to talk to her uh, every second day but because I cannot. And my mother has uh, Alzheimer's disease and so in human interactions are very important for her. But I think that even if some automated uh, technologies could, uh, for example, display the day and the time and uh, the appointments uh, to the physician, uh, the, uh, all of that could be useful, but it will never replace. The point for me is more like to enrich her experience uh, by adding new things, uh, which will be useful if at some point she's uh, a little bit like dependent to uh, some technologies and so on, mm -hmm. instead of replacing. And if I have to replace something in my life, I would prefer to replace something which that can be automated because it's not uh, uh, yeah, human related. So everything which is related to my parents, families, friends, or my community and so on, that should be in the center and the rest should be automated. But, but I, See, the reason I was saying though that the recipient should decide is maybe not your mother, but I could imagine playing a video game that yeah. my son created for me for longer than we would have a conversation and feeling happy that there was a video game that was created for me. I mean, I guess the point is that you, you, you could design something that's very much you, not an AI, but it, you could use AI, but it could be an experience that is something that you created for your mother that takes your mother through a journey. And because I think just making it sound like it's a chatbot makes it sound flat, but, but I could imagine that, and you could even imagine that you don't have to be a programmer, that uh, a, a computer goes through your day and selects all the snippets from your day packages them up and then you give it a little bit of a design and then it unpacks itself over two hours and has a narration to your mother saying this is what Sputnik Go did and this is what's going on. But I think it's just, I, I think if you oversimplify the idea of the design, it will obviously seem inhumane. But I, but I, don't, I think there's a way to amplify your time using machines. Yeah, that, 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 that's very thoughtful because <coughs> I think that, yeah, that's already, I would, let's say, Low tech, that's what we do when we share, for example, pictures yep, or you make yep. a little video clip of your uh, uh, vacations and you show to your parents and whatever, and you spend time and you put an intention. So interactions are not like only direct interactions, but indirect interactions too. I mean, if you, you're an artist and you make a work of art for your mom and you spend hours and hours, she, she will see that and receive that as a real gift and something of yourself, part of yourself. And that would be the same using technologies. But once again, that's not a way to get rid of, to get rid of something like, okay, I don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, the augmentation. Exactly. And really, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that it's more like, it's more like uh, uh, artificial augmentation uh, or inter, um, yeah, than, uh, than just replacement. It's, uh, this empowerment is in the augmentation to my mind. I mean, we can go on with this because these are the challenges of the aging society and, and, and quite relevant. But the fact is that we're not just talking about conversations and talks. We're talking about human touch. Uh, we're talking about people who are not, it's not possible for them to be near their parents all the time. Uh, we can talk about a lot of people who have to make their living uh, going overseas and so on and cannot sort of be in that kind of humane connection uh, with them. So the question becomes is, do we go back to the model and say, this is what dignity and care means? See? Or are we not already using certain interfaces to sort of augment that sense of dignity and care? And so the question becomes like, you know, what would be the sort of um, next stages of, of things? Because we are rampantly talking about furnishing all the nursing home with robots, right? And in some ways, you know, just like you stated that your dog is smarter than certain humans, uh, I have seen robots that are more caring than certain humans. I would prefer certain elderly people just to be around them than, than, than certain humans. Yeah. So again, you know, part of it is the subjective uh, yeah. issue of things, but, but how do we yeah. sort of, uh, do we redefine dignity and care, or do we create certain other sorts of mechanisms to bridge this gap? I mean, just, and just to your point, some people are negative, yep. right? So robot is better than some people. Right. So I think that it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a complex system where 
you know, a robot's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And obviously your actual daughter's better. And, you know, and I think that that's a, that, but, but yeah, I'll, but that was, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I wanted to chat a bit about, you know, going back to the idea of what makes human human, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or uh, 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 a living creature, a living creature. And traditionally, the, historically, the argument has been around sentience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and while Asian religions have been using sentient as a defining criteria, in the West, mostly it was contrasted in 1600s to contrast with reason, that sentient uh, creatures are creatures that feel, mm -hmm. say, uh, my, meaning they are not only thinking, but they also feel. And part of the precursor, prerequisite for the feeling is that they have consciousness, they are self-aware, and so on and so forth. Um, can machines be sentient? So maybe here we can start with you. Can machines be sentient? Um, or, or do you yeah. imagine a possibility or do you completely discount it? I think um, this is something I, I might... I, I think it's all up to how humans perceive. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is up to how humans perceive how machine could be sentient. I, I remember there was a viral video of a robotic dog being kicked around by yes. humans yeah. and it went right. Twitter, I think social media was mad seeing this ro robotic dog being kicked around. And then um, another thing, I, this might throw the question like upside down, <laughs> <laughs> is that I think when we think about AI, we let all robots. I, I think we tend to want to think of them as another being that we communicate with, and because like that's often what we see in science fiction films yeah. or anime, like Doraemon or some of the robots caring for the elderly. Yeah. But I think all, looking at how things technology is turning out right now, it feels like 95, more than 95 percent of AI is actually things surrounding us that's not really acting like beings mm -hmm. but they are having an immense impact in how we feel or how we think mm -hmm. for example TikTok or Facebook or Twitter is really impacting how I feel every day or even the news so um th this is throwing your question <laughs> no, it's fine, it's fine. yeah so we, we often discuss is AI like how like, is a machine, can it be sent in? But these algorithms, they you know, they are really having a lot of effect on us. Right. And I on think yeah. maybe we are thinking too much about these algorithm, algorithms and AIs as beings mm -hmm. than we should. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, sorry, I didn't answer the question, but. No, it's all right. Yeah. Actually, I, I, I would like to go in, in the same way, and I, I mean, I, I'm not a, um, a tech person, I'm an ethicist, so I will not say if the, the machine with this technology can or not. My, my perspective, this is just an opinion, is that probably not. But it's more about the, uh, the criteria, what it is to be sentient, and to be sentient as a human and not an, as an animal, uh, which already for sure has feelings and so on, is also to have a kind of understanding about your destiny. And that makes a difference, I think, because uh, um, that's perhaps the specificity currently of the human species, not only to be uh, self-aware about you with your fears and you're hungry or you want some company, a dog can have this kind of feelings, but also, uh, let's say, to see the difference between who you are and who you would like to be or where you want to go. And this is this kind of questions. And I would say from a Christian perspective, I would say the kind of gap which, which is between willing to be God and not being God, willing to be almighty, to be eternal and not being. That's, I would say, the main source of suffering for the human being, this kind of gap that we always try to bridge, but we, we cannot. Um, and at the same time, that what makes us human, that what uh, uh, moves us uh, ahead. And I think that if one day a machine can truly have this kind of, of uh, feeling, deep feeling of, uh, uh, yeah, it's, I would say, uh, uh, almost, yeah, philosophical uh, perspective of who 
uh, it is, uh, probably then we'll consider it sentient. But uh, I agree with you here that uh, we already very, uh, drastically transformed by the interactions we have with all those uh, AI-based technologies, like, I don't know, uh, um, the algorithms in a dating app. For example, we had a workshop in Paris uh, with uh, the people running uh, one of those dating apps, and they said that actually the algorithm is designed uh, to try to get some matches, but not too fast. Otherwise, you leave the, the social network, you leave the app, and you're not a customer anymore. If they want you to pay, they, if, they want, uh, if they want you to meet someone you will spend a, a nice time with, but not marry. So this is terrible because actually it, it shows you, uh, it uh, profiles and uh, rushes you to meet people knowing that they will not be a match. For me, this, this is terrible. There's a kind of tension between your interest and the interest of the platform owner. And, and we need to, to check the way, uh, uh, yeah, those technologies already transform the way we interact, we work, even time to time we love. And for me, we, we should be more focused on that because this is right now and it has a huge impact on the life of the people. Yeah. But, so, but if it, I think if you approach it from cognitive science, there's a little bit of a different way to describe it. So the, I think the biggest difference between humans and animals, one, one of the ones that cognitive scientists think about is humans imagine a future. So they, they and this is tied a little bit to yours, mm. so, so they try to come up with a model of the world which allows them to speculate about different scenarios of the future and what decisions they make affect what futures might happen. And, and most animals can't do that. And so, so just imagination is one. And then the, the other thing, and it's related to that, is you come up with models. So, so, so in, in, in there's a, Rebecca Sachs at MIT does this work, but it's theory of mind. So I come up with a model of a simulation of Tenzin in my head. And whenever I watch Tenzin behaving, I update the model based on what I see him doing or not doing. And then I can choose to be helpful or <laughs> choose to be harmful to Tenzin. But if I'm trying to be helpful, what I try to do is imagine what Tenzin's goal is. And I imagine what he's doing. And then I imagine what I could do to help him towards his goal. And Tenzin always has his own model of the world. And he's got a path and a destiny. And he's trying to update his model. But the reason why it's important is that you can't solve this model, right? It, there's no solution. It, you either are trying to help the direction or you're trying to stop Tenzin or whatever, but the idea of having simulations of people's minds is, even if it's not that effective, that's, that's much more, let's call it human, than say with the large language models and pattern recognition, which is, I'm, like this, the large language models aren't creating models of you in, their, in, in the computer. It's creating lots of patterns of lots of human beings and it's saying in this situa situations, human beings tend to do this. Or if I'm trying to have this outcome, I'm gonna solve this equation, which is much more like computation. Mm. Whereas I think if you have a, a theory of mind where you have models of all the humans and imagine, imagination about right. what they're trying to do, and then you're trying to help them, I think then the machines may not be the same kind of, um, you know, as humans, but I think it becomes closer, at least emotionally to me, right, right. with sentience than, than just a, a computation in power, yeah. I, I think, I mean, you know, th th that remains sort of a challenge going forward, right? In the, in the sense that, uh, as we were discussing earlier in the paper, that, that um, efficiency-driven algorithms uh, don't always become ethical al mm -hmm. algorithms. Yeah. Uh, they can be rule-based yeah. uh, uh, algorithms, so there's a compliance factor to it. But then the fact is that, uh, you know, human beings themselves, nature is not ethical, for example. You know, there's a, a conversation that uh, uh, we used to have with uh, Kevin Esfeld oftentimes because he was sort of, uh, when he was trying to utilize CRISPR uh, to lessen the suffering in, in, in mice mm -hmm. uh, by eradicating Lyme disease and so on. Uh, this thing was, you know, Nature is not ethical. Uh, you know, if you if you look at the food pyramid scheme, there's nothing ethical about it, right? Uh, so the question then becomes: is that when we start introducing factors of betterment of what we think should make a better human being, imagination is one, but let's say empathy or compassion or a sense of wisdom, respond, you start asking yourself: well, we haven't done actually. We don't have very good track record of that as 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 humans, uh, you know. Uh, of being more compassionate or, or being more empathetic. We talk a lot about it, but it doesn't manifest. I mean, look at the state of the world. It just does not manifest. So the next layer becomes, and this is where I'm 
again, uh, going to start with you here, which is that we are looking at certain platforms that are changing our behavior functions, TikTok, social media, and so on. Not just mood swings, but behavioral functions, right? Do you envision, like even in the framework of science fiction or anything like that, where machines can actually help us become better humans? And, and how would you design those things as, as, as I suppose? So um, one of my artworks that I created before is called The Menstruation Machine. Mm -hmm. So it's a machine that allows people who don't menstruate, oftentimes men, but <laughs> to experience the process of menstruation, the bleeding and the stomach pain. So, so that maybe um, there's better understanding between you know, different sexes and have more conversation about menstruation, which has been treated as a taboo, taboo subject, right. for right. so long. And uh, I think um, I'd like to introduce one topic in the idea of um, better like Peace, uh, machine yeah, that, yeah, yeah. or transhumanism is um, I, I think uh, female body or women's health is an interesting topic in transhumanism because um, uh, what I'm currently doing, um, I, I'm an artist, but I currently um, I founded and run a company about women's health. And uh, I'm uh, currently um, trying to help women, especially in Japan, learn more about menstruation, pregnancy, menopause, and learn about different treatments to help uh, alleviate their pain. And what's interesting is that so like m menstruation, like PMS, menstruation pain really affects the lives of women. But since the topic has been treated as taboo, a lot of women don't know how to treat their pain. Like, for example, contraceptive pills are known to treat PMS or men menstrual pain. But the pills were not approved in Japan until 1999, which is like almost 40 years after the United States. <laughs> And also like pregnant, like issues of pregnancy. Also, um, I gave birth last year and epidural birth, like so procedure to lessen your pain when you give birth. In Japan, only 6% of women have that treatment. I think in France, more than 80% of women. Yeah, and it's, it's huge. Yeah, and uh, so in Europe, it's like 80, 90%. In Japan, it's 6%. I think China also 10%. And I once did a plot of um, whether gender inequality, gender gap index is correlated with how many women decide to do epidural right. birth. And it has a perfect correlation. So smaller the gender gap, more women opt for epidural birth. Mm -hmm. And larger the gender gap, less women um, opt for ep uh, epidural birth. And what happens in Japan and China is that I think a lot of women, um, their husband or their mother-in-law don't want them to go through epidural birth because they think that mothers need to um, experience the true natural true pain, pain yeah, right. to be a true mother. So I think women, like this idea of being human is surrounds women a lot more. Right. Like being a mother, you need to experience the pain of birth or pain of menstruation. That uh, It's not natural to take the pill to... That's a great point. That's a great point. I mean, yes. So, so that's one of the things is that, you know, uh, as we were talking about transhumanism or, or its experience as a spectrum, it's easy to argue about, you know, with the roboticist and, and the future or immortality, but it's the mid-group where I think we are seeing a lot of these dilemmas. You know, like the Amish community in the, in the United States, anti-technology. and But... Recently, they started actually taking a tremendous amount of interest in uh, gene technologies because the community widely is suffering from Down syndrome because of inbreeding o o o over a number of years. Is that transhuman? Is it? Or is that you know, changing the identity of the community and so on? So those are, I think, some very relevant and, and pressing subjects uh, for us. To, to, to my mind, yeah. the problem is very often uh, it deals with this uh, idea we have about tradition. Tradition is not something monolithic that you, you just have to copy and paste. It's a kind of treasure. You have to take things from the past to answer the questions of the future. And so, for example, to go back to your, your uh, 
uh, subjects, uh, you, you topic about uh, suffering to give birth. I mean, if you read in the book of Genesis, it's a, it's, it was seen as a consequence of the original sin. But just because I guess that several thousand years ago, people had to find a meaning to that, why it was so terrible to give birth, uh, why it was so painful, and at the same time, it's beautiful. So they try to find a way to link that but now we know more uh, about uh, 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 the, the way the body works and so on. And so we could try to give some, take something about the meaning and relieve, I mean, to, to let go what's, what's outdated. And I think that's what we do. We Eric, should. you don't want to go in that direction because then we start conversations around contraceptions. You know, like, for example, tradition versus present reality of things the amount of suffering that is caused by lack of contraception, but tradition not allowing it in that way. Um, is that... But no, I mean, humane? tradition no, means not. that we, you also need to deal with that and renew something. Tradition is not like uh, it was said in the old time that you have to do that, so do that forever. It's there are values and for that, at, uh, uh, as much as we discover new things, you, uh, you need to reinterpret it. That's what tradition, how tradition works. Tradition is not something that you will have to apply forever. I'm sure about that. Personally, uh, yeah. I, I try to draw a line where telling other people what to do, first of all, I think that people should be, to the extent that it doesn't impinge on set other people, yeah. People, I think, should be allowed to do mostly what they want, as long as it doesn't cause a disaster for the rest of the world. And I think one of the problems with a lot of ethics is it's about telling other people what they should feel. It's, right? it's very normative but, and prescriptive and, and, historically. And, and, yeah, yes. and, but I think yeah. it, when it starts to affect the system, and this yeah. is why it's so complicated, because people mm -hmm. might say having those people among us makes our system worse. But, mm -hmm. but, but I think that that and it gets back to the earlier point about you know d does it feel creepy and stuff like that, or like your mother conversation. I think there are a lot of kids younger generation who feel comfortable, let's say, buying digital goods and to tell them that it's not real. I, if they think it's real, it is, right? And, and so I think a lot of it is that actually tradition and culture evolves too, right? And so when we're living in the jungle, we talk to nature, but maybe the young people, nature doesn't talk to them, but machines talk to them. And mm -hmm. to replace, to, to say that replacing nature with machines is unnatural, is a little bit to me a little too judgy mm -hmm. of young people, and I think that that we, anyway that that would just that that and to your point, I think that we have to be quite tolerant of an emerging culture around this. I I, 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 I cannot agree with you more on that. I, I think that's part of the ch challenge is that uh, you know increasingly, at least as far as social learning and human learning is is, is happening, um, you know. This used to be the thing, your parents, my parents, you know, uh, they were in this thing that, oh, don't do this because, you know, this, you, know you couldn't read comic books, mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't play video games, you, meaning those were all sort of things that were tabooed in, in, in certain ways because the tradition mm -hmm. uh, culturally did not allow for those things. But I think, you know, part of the, the, the issue today is that the growth of technology is happening so fast, mm -hmm. right? And every uh, startup wants to scale, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, they're like evangelizers, right? They want to just take over the entire world, you know, with, with their product, with their tools and, and, and things of that nature. And we have talked about the dangers of scaling up too quickly mm -hmm. at times because you can't turn back the clock. Uh, you cannot undo the damage uh, uh, on those regards. So when it comes to sort of adoption of AI and adoption of, uh, some of some of these kinds of systems, what would you suggest? Like, you know, yes, we can talk about government regulations and so on, which are often very slow uh, to, uh, to uh, even build a consensus around. And even if you build a consensus, it's like, who's going to implement it uh, in this way? But if you're talking to such technology, so now you're interfacing Silicon Valley and, mm -hmm. and other sort of such ambitious groups who are on the other end of the spectrum of transhuman. What would be some succinct advice that you could give them that, hey, this is how you can continue doing what you're doing in certain ways, but this is how humanity must remain relevant and must maintain its sense of importance. Yeah, so so I, I was talking about tolerance to the extent that it doesn't destroy the world, right? Yep. And, and I think that when we're talking about people building things that affect everyone, 
then we have to have a conversation. And I think that for me, the, the, one, of the, one of the, like let's call it, um, instead of problem, but one of the things is that people who like the technology build a sensibility about the technology, mm -hmm. but often the people who have, are critical don't like it, so they don't build an intuitive understanding. And I think that really what's important is to become a native of that technology to be able to imagine where it's going. And I think one of the problems is that usually the people who are kind of obsessively happy about the thing get an intuitive understanding, and the cautious people don't. And so, like, in, like the gun control people make fun of gun laws in the U.S. because they're clearly written by people who don't use guns. So they're written in an ineffective way, you know, and the people who like guns don't write gun control laws. So, right, right. so it, and similarly, I think a lot of the people who are thinking about ethics of AI don't make AI, so they don't intuitively understand it. And I think that one of the key categories of people conversation are people who are somewhat critical who understand it well. And, and I think that that's, and we, there are certain individuals, but I think we need to build, first of all, build up that sensibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where kind of cross-fertilization is to get people who are native to come into ethics conversations and social conversations right. and get the, the social people out. And part of this is education. We're here at Chiba Institute of Technology, right. a big engineering university. And the reason I'm bringing these conversations here is to get engineering students to understand things like ethics and religion and art and design. And then the con converse. So, because so, I don't, I, so it, I don't, not answering your question directly, but I think the way is that somebody who understands both right. to present a future of the world that's both technically rigorous, but also sort of humanly sensible. And I don't think we have that category very well. Right. Maybe for the last few minutes, if we can open up the conversation. I, I am interested in what you were talking about here about the, the gender sort of experience, mm -hmm. because that was one of the sort of phenomenal things about building empathy towards what women are going through. Mm -hmm. um, we are going through this issue of gender fluidity these days. Oh, right? yes. And society is less empathetic than they were even to women at, at, at times, right? Yeah, yes. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that would be one of the things. But Karthik, uh, you... <laughs> are you uh, he's not prepared. <laughs> um, I mean, along the same lines, in, in terms of the the... The issue with uh, uh, implementing machine learning algorithms for cardiology and their sampling based on data just w that were only done on men and how they would misdiagnose women uh, over a period of time. Could you just briefly speak to that? Yeah. Um, in cardiology, most clinical trials were overwhelmingly done on men and the field basically said if you have chest pain, it can be one of two types, either typical or atypical. And atypical chest pain was only experienced by women. So one of the projects that we worked on was not the use of machine learning to predict who gets typical and atypical, but uh, using it to expose that bias, so to speak, and say, women experience the same kind of symptoms men do. It's just that it hasn't been studied. And I actually look at it as a use of AI to address some inequities, which would otherwise be um, pretty difficult historically to do. So I think there is a positive use of some of these technologies to address some of these. Uh, and, and, and I think the way I describe what Karthik did versus, so, so most AI right now is used to make short-term predictions mm -hmm about individuals. So it's right. usually powerful people predicting a behavior of an individual, whether it's an ad or whether it's uh, a loan. But you can use AIs for individuals to understand long-term systems, like the health system. So, so right now, AI is usually powerful people pointing it down. But you can have less powerful people have AI that points it up. Mm -hmm. And AI could also help you understand and increase awareness. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we were talking about augmentation. I think that AI, if it's democratized and pointed at the system, all of us should become more aware of what's going on in the economy and in politics and society so we can make decisions that are better informed. Mm -hmm. Instead of what we do right now is we empower people to make bad decisions 
more powerfully, mm -hmm. but aren't actually making them more aware because they already know what they want. They want to give you ads more accurately, but that's not helping them question the goal. Mm -hmm. But awareness should help us rethink our goals mm -hmm. because we understand the world better. So it should be awareness augmentation mm -hmm. rather than lack of aware people having execution augmented, mm -hmm. which is kind of what most AI mm -hmm. is funded to do. Yeah. yeah. But then also we need to be aware that, like you said, like a lot of trials didn't, dis didn't include women. Like F I think FDA didn't include women for how many years? Like 20, 30, for a long time, uh, saying that women who are capable of being pregnant, so at childbearing age, were completely removed from the experiments, mm. which makes it so, so that a lot of medicine, medications, are uh, designed for male bodies. So yeah, we should collect data mm -hmm. from as many different people as possible to make a fairer mm -hmm. decision-making system. And uh, also, th there was an interesting technology panel I, I saw in Japan, where the technology panel was talking about the future uh, where, of Japan. Mm -hmm. And it said, um, diversity of humans and robots so it's talking about diversity of humans, robots, and AI, but the panel was all men. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, in Japan, diversity between robots and men probably come before men and women yeah, in man. Japan. Yeah, yeah. So, they do like, believe in diversity. Yeah, it's just a different task. Yeah, yeah, not, not women, but robots and humans. <laughs> like, they, didn't they realize what they're talking about when looking at their own panel? So, um, yeah, I, I hope that, <laughs> that the but mindset I mean, changes. It, it is an interesting sort of, you know, uh, I mean, you know, not even talking about sort of the the, the sentience of the algorithm or, or, or AI, but but the whole idea of like, um, you know, the changing nature of relationship or, or intimacy with machines mm -hmm. uh, that that we are beginning to see that wasn't, I think, that uh, uh, sort of obvious in our generation. But but you see it as you, uh, you know when you when you're working with younger students and so on. I think it's changing something, and I, I, I don't exactly know well, what. It's, there's yeah. a, so, um, uh, what is it? Kate Darling talks about this yeah, with yeah. robot rights, but it, similar to the robot dog thing. Yeah. Actually, she, there's a lot of data that shows that people feel m more upset by a robot being abused than a human being abused. Yep, yep, you know, yep. And it's a very strange effect. Yeah, you know. yeah but that, that's, for me, that's one of the dangers of all those transspecies movement and so on, trying to take care about everything around, but unfortunately not being so focused on the human beings, and most of the time, the discriminated ones or the underprivileged ones. And I think that, to go back to your point, I think that it's all a question of governance, and we really need to change drastically the way the key technologies having a, a heavier, the heavier impact on the heaviest impact on the society have to be governed. To my, to my mind, this is, this is key. And, and part of like being more inclusive, more, being more gender balance but also stopping considering that smart people wealthy people powerful people could decide for the others mm -hmm. and fortunately that's too much the case and because they I mean they have the power to 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 fund the projects they have the power to do a lot but I think it has to be I mean we need to ask the the the, the, the point of view of the people who will really be impacted and this is something which is not done enough to my mind and it leads to a, a massive rejection of some of those technologies, especially uh, in, in Europe and in Canada, and we see that some of the technologies, they are just blocked because, because people are not in the loop, I would say. No, I, I think that will remain a challenge in the landscape, especially of AI, because when you look at it, it's about 10 companies that are controlling all the major uh, AI other researchers. <laughs> Again, one of the things that we're doing this with MIT and Chiba yeah. Kodai is the probabilistic computing that we, I was talking about, right. that actually takes much less computing power. Oh, we right. can actually run the models in a browser. Yep. So by lowering the cost of doing AI, yep. it takes the power back and distributes it more. And, right. and actually the reason universities are so behind is it takes so much compute now to do AI, so it's in the big tech companies. So that right. unlocking that I think should be helpful too. Yep. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? When I was, uh, I had my grandfather, I, I loved him really much and I lost him uh, when I was a child. And I really talk, want to talk to him. And I was like 10 years ago, I was thinking to make um, my grandfather's bot. And 
that back then the AI is not so clever, but nowadays you can scan the people, like make a virtual human, and AI can learn their voice and uh, maybe I can record. Uh, actually, my grandfather was architect, the city planner, so he wrote a book, so AI can read and uh, understand how he, he thinks. And if I can talk to him now, so it's maybe a little bit radical or, or extreme, but uh, if uh, after life, the subhuman, the person passed away, but still the family can talk, uh, communicate with them, and so if the, is a, a peace of mind uh, for the family, but... Uh, My question is, how does it help to uh, do the mourning process? Because exactly. at some point you also need let to let go. people go, yeah. And, and to go to go ahead, so keeping memories from them, it can be pictures, can be recorded. I was going to say something about Jesus Christ, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> he didn't let him die. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Just he came back. That's the point. That's completely different. <laughs> I mean, that's not our choice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, th this is th the point. Is, this is interesting because the question is, how do we build on top of things? Mm -hmm. How do we uh, how do we go ahead? And I think that in this process, probably some things can block the people in a time when I mean, it can be a kind of time loop, yeah. and they will be blocked. And for the flourishing, it's not so good. But, but yeah. I think I think that's just only half joking. I think that that there is a notion of like, what would Jesus do? What right. would my grandfather do? Yep, yep. And if you had an AI that had taken all of their writings, all of their things, and, and said, well, he would probably say this, and here are the five reasons why he would probably say that. That could be quite useful if you were trying to learn from your grandfather, right? Yes or not. I would say the point, for example, just to take the example of Jesus Christ, because I don't <laughs> know your grandfather, but <laughs> I would say that the point is also, uh, it, it's related to what we said about uh, uh, the inter interpretation of uh, tradition. It allows you to have answers that probably would not have been his one at that time, but that could be in the spirit of, and also it involves you in the decision, in the way you will deal with that. So, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, even from the, the Middle Age, from the 13th century, Thomas Aquinas said that the final cut, the final decision has to be the one of the people. So ethics can set norms and so on, but at the end of the day, you choose because it's your own responsibility. Mm -hmm. And my, my fear would be if it empowers you, like providing guidance, new ideas, whatever, but the danger is that at some point, you don't have to make this own process of, mm -hmm. oh, if he would be here, what would he do? Mm -hmm. And this process, to my mind, is very rich for uh, our, uh, um, yeah, uh, the, but, the way but we that could, But that could also be like delegating your own decision making or critical thinking, right? But, th but for yeah. me, this kind of delegation yeah, yeah. is decreasing the humanity exactly. than instead yeah. of increasing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on how, the, how it's designed, because it could also be that it, you take the model of the f grandfather and yeah. it, try to add it to yours, or it could mm -hmm. be that you can have the conversation. Mm -hmm. you know? but, um, but yeah, I, I could see how well, it could I, be. I yeah. think the current, current theme on that is mostly nostalgia, right? It's, it's yeah. mostly about the idea of uh, you know, not like precisely like not being able to mourn, not not letting people mm -hmm. go, and the whole idea is to keep them there in some ways. Yeah. And and you know, sentiments and nostalgia aside, the the issue becomes: is that good for mental well-being yeah. of the and individual? And I and I would guess it probably depends, right? Yeah. Like I think, should you be banned from looking at photographs of exactly. dead people, right? Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. you know, and it could be that if you're the sole widow survivor, right. that being able to go through I, you These know, processes, memories yeah, might not yeah, be a yeah, bad thing, yeah. right? But I guess it could be abused as well. So, right, right. Yeah. My question is like the technology is developing at a very high speed, like the rate is so high. Comparing to two decades before, the speed of internet is like very less and now it's speed up to a million times. And also at the end, the technology is used by human us and specifically the brain. But the brain is not developing that fast. So in future, how can the brain and the technology match this? I mean, you know, when technologies are talking, they're talking about exponential growth all the time. Mm -hmm. But human adaptation mm -hmm. um, has certain limitations, right? Like, and so should humans try to adapt to 
faster growing technologies or, 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 or how should we do well, it? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I would say just who's the boss? Huh? Is it the human being or the technology? Amazon. Yeah, if Amazon <laughs> is the boss, we have to adapt to Amazon. If we consider that the human being is the, uh, the one supposed to benefit, I mean, the technology has to be at the speed of the human but, being at some point. But, but I, think, I think if we focus too much on speed, yeah. like for instance, the, the iPhone's probably easier to use than the old IBM mainframe, right? And so you can make very fast, very complicated things quite elegant and quite humane. And so I think user interface has gotten easier to use these devices. And if the machine gets even more powerful, it can start to adapt to individuals, it can start to speak to you. So, so I don't think that, that more technology will necessarily be harder. And I could imagine that in VR, for certain people, it will be much more comfortable than typing. You know? so, so, so I think that, that as long as we're designing them well, and that they're adjusting to us rather than us adjusting to them, I think we'll be able to keep up because it, by definition, not by definition, but we could easily make it so that it's always within the limits of the human brain. You know? And then I think the thing that's complicated actually more than the machines is biology. So if we start to increase the size of the brain or increase the capacity of the humans, then I think it starts to stretch in a different way. But, but, I, but I think you know, that it, it, there's a reasonably good chance that it kind of blows up and goes really badly. But, but I think one of the things is that um, you know, there are m moments where things get a lot of pressure, where we're getting overloaded and stuff like that. But I think that we'll start to feel that pain and the technology and other things will adapt. Um, so speaking of feeling the pain, uh, maybe we can spend two minutes talking about something that is still relevant on, on something which is metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, how should humans respond to it? however they want to respond. <laughs> 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 no, that's a very democratic thing. All right, dictatorial thing. <laughs> How should humans respond to something like metaverse? Uh, is, I mean, is it a choice? Because, you know, there are social pressures, like there, there are people have fear of missing out. All my friends are in metaverse. I'm not there. I'm missing out the social time. I'm missing out the community time. I mean, where, where should we go with it? Uh, currently, there's, I mean, at least in Europe and I think in Northern America, there's a common sense. Uh, I mean, 75 percent of young, young adults in Europe are against the metaverse. Oh, they are reluctant, 75 percent. Uh, they are reluctant. They, they, they just need to see if it's really beneficial, but they will not rush to get into it. And I think this is, uh, this is a pretty good, yeah, this is a proof of wisdom. So, so the, they will wait for some data to be gathered if yeah, it is beneficial uh, uh, and Oh, okay. and, and just, if, just even to see what's in it f for them. Right, so, right, so, yeah. And I think that this, this is wise. But uh, yeah, I, I would say that unfortunately too often we rush to something which is like increasing the like performance, the efficiency and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you, you were talking about. And I think that at some point we also need to uh, let space for vulnerability. I mean, that's also what makes us human. I mean, there's a kind of uh, uh, additional beatitude which says uh, blessed are the crack pots because grace goes through the cracks. And I think that's true. So, so at some point, something happens when you're also vulnerable and not everything is just designed to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So let's try to keep that imperfect and this kind of perfect imperfection of the human being. And, and I think that in the metaverse, probably we will have to keep that too. Otherwise, we will have a world which is like so perfect that it will be disconnected from the users. Hero. I, I actually... I, you get I'm, the last word. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I, I created avatars that menstruate in the metaverse. Sorry for being <laughs> mismenstruation like yeah. today. <laughs> and the avatars got immediately banned. The metaverse is not as decentralized as we hope it to be. So in, in decentralized, no menstruation is allowed in the metaverse. So <laughs> I had oh. to change a color to blue blood. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Like the old adverts like, wow. of napkins. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. yeah that, that was, that's my first experience with the metaverse, being banned. So I, my avatar is a refugee. Oh, okay. interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know if they changed it, but for a while in Decentraland, they couldn't ban Nazi stuff because they couldn't get a majority vote. Right. Oh, my. Kind of incredible. But then they banned menstruation. Yeah. I have to, I have to <laughs> dig into that. But yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. And then also for me, like, I can shop online with one click. Will I want to go to a 3D supermarket and walk through the aisle right, and right, like, pick right, up? Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not too sure. So I, I think 
metaverse could be a little bit hyped. So I, I like to see like what, like why maybe gaming like there's a lot of potential. But yeah. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in World of Warcraft, and there's definitely a different feeling of hanging out in a 3D space with right. people mm. running around and dancing and chatting and stuff like that. And, and, and I think hanging out actually is actually a thing that you can do, especially if you have audio. And that's been around for a while. Right. And I think for, and, and one of uh, Ikigami-san, who's also a researcher with us here, she did a study of autistic communities in Second Life. And it's very comfortable for autistic yep. people to be able to you know, and not have to make eye contact, but still have a 3D space and show emotions, and but be able to type the emotion to right. be able to show it, so that you know you don't have to. You know, it's it's so 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 for certain ca categories of interaction, I think it will it already works quite well. To be continued. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank very you much. so much. Thank you. Thank you.